Hey, would you grab your Bibles, please, to um, Psalm 92 and stand at the reading of God's Word. Psalms 92. This is just, if you're in one of those grumpy-ish kind of moods, I'm telling you, this psalm, get it in your heart, get it in your spirit, it will just, just do the same thing this, the psalmist is saying to do it well. It's a song for the Sabbath day, and I tell you, it's a song for our days. But what I want us to do is, as he is talking about praising the Lord and just how good it is and how good God is, and for you make me glad by your deeds, O oh Lord, and oh, I just love this psalm. But there is an amazing promise for us found in verses 12, 13, and 14. Look down in your word. And let's just, let's read it from there. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of the Lord. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, the Lord is upright. He's my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you and thank you for this promise. In fact, the five promises here. And Lord, because we have Jesus and we press into him right now by faith, these promises are ours right now. And they are yes in him. And we give you the glory. Speak to us now. Lord, encourage our hearts. And right now, through your holy word, I pray in Jesus' name. Turn around and say to one another, you've got to show up to grow up. Would you please? Amen. Amen. What a wonderful song. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow up like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. See that first line in verse 13? Planted in the house of the Lord. Usually with God's promises in the Bible, there is always a condition to them. There is always a condition, and this is the condition to these promises. Planted in the house of the Lord. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to do more than merely visit church every once in a while, but rather we need to plant ourselves there, being a regular part of its services, its ministries, its outreaches, its, its fellowship activities. We do. That's what it means to plant yourself into something. When I was a youth, someone had commented to my pastor, and he was my mentor, Dr. Roy Sapp, saying, you know, you don't have to go to church to get saved. To which my pastor replied, you're right. You don't have to go to church to get saved. But then he pointed his finger in this guy's face, and he says, but you need to go to church to live saved. Amen. And that stuck with me. See, there are just too many things that God has called each Christian to be and to do that simply can't be done outside the context of a regular involvement in a local church. Now, we've been talking these past three weeks now about God's special presence, about the way God presents and manifests his presence in certain circumstances and in special ways. You know, we know that God is all present all times. As the psalmist said, though I make my bed and shield in the grave, you are there with me. Though I'm on the heights, there you are with me. Being, being developed in my mother's womb, there you are planning me and planning my days. God is with us. Amen. 
He's with us. Amen. But God's manifest presence shows up in some really, really special ways. And, 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 and we saw that when we fail, when we blow it, God is manifesting his presence in a kind, gracious, and merciful way, prompting us for, for, for repentance and asking forgiveness and making it right. Last week, we saw how God shows up in a special way in our joy, the joy that comes from him. That's amazing. This morning, what we're seeing is that God shows up in a very special way when we gather together in church. Read it with me, would you? Psalm, I mean, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2.22. And in him, Jesus, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. There is no other institution on earth where one can experience God's abiding or dwelling presence than that church where brothers and sisters are being built together. Amen. You can't replicate it any other place. You can't experience it any other place. It is, it is built. It, it happens with us. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, according to the passage that we're looking at then, God is telling us when we're planted then in church life, there are some remarkable benefits. There are some remarkable things that begin to happen among us. Let's, let's, let's look at that. There's five benefits that happens to us when we get planted in church and church life. Pick it up in verse 12, the first, the first part of verse 12. Read it with me. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. I want you to think about how palm trees has this amazing ability to grow and to produce fruit in desert environments. Now, palm trees are really important to God. We know that because when we read the book of Ezekiel and at the last, last few chapters of Ezekiel, he's talking about what the great temple during the millennium is going to look like. And on that temple, on its walls, are going to be carved these palm trees. Wow, it's just amazing. You know, when you and I are planted in church where we grow our roots deep in its life and in its culture, we too can flourish even in seasons where things out there or things in our home life is pretty harsh. That's what it says. Why is that? How does that work? It's because God has designed his church to be like a family. You know, it's home. It's a safe place for you and I, no matter what. It's a place where all of us should be welcomed. Well, if it's home, don't, don't, my home, we bug each other. Well, it, that happens. It happens. It happens. But it's a place to, where we're welcomed and we feel loved and, and we're protected and we're nurtured and cleaned up and corrected and, and have brothers and sisters to encourage us. The Bible says, be encouraged, encourage one another so that you will not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's amazing when we get planted in the house of the Lord, just God moves in a very special and a wonderful way so that we can, we can just flourish no matter how harsh, no matter what's happening out there. It's amazing. Well, look at else. It's not just, it's just not just we can flourish, but look what else it says in, the, in verse 12. Read it with me. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Now, prized throughout the ancient Near East, the wood from the cedar of Lebanon grew strong and hard. It was impervious to bugs. It was aromatic. It was very durable, and it was highly, highly desirable. Do you know that that wood was used by the Egyptian kings to build their ships? It was used by King David to build his palace. And then King Solomon used that same kind of wood to build the temple. So what, what, what is this metaphor actually saying to us? 
according to this metaphor, as we plant ourselves in church life, we likewise not just grow mighty and strong, but we likewise become high in quality. There's something about our spiritual life that really becomes, becomes a quality thing because we are a part of a local church. And God is ministering through that. But, but you go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, Sister Grumpy Bottom, she's been coming for 10 years and she's involved in everything. And that woman, old Sister Grumpy Bottom, she just is just the most sourest, negative, ugly old person. It's just awful to be around. And you're telling me that her spiritual life is now at a quality? I'm saying, yeah, you should have seen her before she started coming to church. <laughs> why, why is that? What, what is it about us planning ourselves into our church life that God moves in a special way to just create a quality? Well, not only is church designed by God to be like a home, but church is also designed by God to be like a school. It's where God gives teachers to teach, leaders to lead, pastors to oversee and protect and learn. Someone asked, what's the role of a pastor? My job is to lead, feed, correct, protect. That's what, that's what pastors do, you know? For God, God is here. And it's just this place where in his ministries, we become equipped to be the people God wants us to be, to do the stuff that God wants us to do. People who are planted in the house of the Lord. Look at what else it says. Look at the third promise we're like. Read it, and it's, it's the last part of verse 13. They will flourish in the courts of our God. That word flourish there literally in the Hebrew means to bud, to blossom, and to bear fruit. It's like what happened with Aaron's rod when, when, when Aaron's rod was put before the Ark of the Covenant. Re remember the story. In Numbers chapter 16, a guy and his clan named Korah came to Moses and said, why do we need a Levite priesthood? We could all be priests. We could all be our own priests. Kind of like people say, we could all be our own pastors. Why do we need priests before God? Why do we need therefore? We could all bring this fire before God. Moses said, interesting question. Come out tomorrow, bring your fire first thing in the morning, and God will answer us. And so Korah and his whole clan, I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of them, came out to meet with Moses, to hear what God had to say. And they, they lit their fire. It was strange fire. It wasn't the fire that God prescribed. Lit their fire. And God's answer to them was simply this. He opened the ground and swallowed them up and closed the ground again. Yikes. Yeah. Korah's rebellion. Now, what's amazing is that should have just answered it for the whole everybody, right? You would have thought that we'd go, okay, we get the point. Thank you very much, Lord, you know. Let's not, let's not ask about God's ways. But God understood the tactic of the enemy. You see, Satan plays the long game with us. He doesn't just try to get us to mess up right now. What he tries to do is he puts these thoughts, he puts these ideas, he puts these little things in us, and he just lets them fester and lets them grow, and lets them build, and lets them, because he knows they're going to do their work. God knew that though Korah and his whole clan was taken care of, the idea that Korah posed would still be bouncing around in everybody's mind. So the Lord told Moses the next day, and you can find this in number 17, go to every head of all 12 tribes, and from every head, get their staff, big old wooden stick. 
and inscribed their name, the head of, of each tribe, their name. And so they went to all 12 tribes and they went to the Levites and Aaron was the head of the whole tribe. And so they inscribed Aaron's name, who happened to be the high priest at that time. Then God told Moses, take all 12 of those staffs, take it into the tabernacle, because they didn't have a temple then. It was a movable tent temple called the tabernacle. Take it into the tabernacle and lay it before the Ark of the Covenant. And so Moses did. And so then God says, now the next morning you go in there and you get the staffs. So Moses did. The next morning he got all 12 staffs, brought them out. There's your staff, yours, here's your staff. Still old, dry staff, except Aaron's. Aaron's staff flourished in the Hebrew, budded, bloomed, and bore almonds. Just to amen that God's life is in God's plans and God's ways. Amen? You see, when we're planted in the house of the Lord, where it says they flourish in the courts of our God, instead of feeling condemned and guilt-tripped and unwanted and useless before God when we pray or when we worship, that's all a lie of the enemy because Jesus paid it all, even when we mess up big time. You now, in the name of Jesus, have this open invitation and this welcome and this cleansing. You do. But instead of walking away feeling I'm just useless, I'm just second class, God will never use me. When we plant ourselves in the house of the Lord, even when we come before the Lord, whether or not it's through worship, through prayer, through confession. And by the way, how many of you asked forgiveness this week from the Lord? How many of you asked forgiveness more than once? My brothers and sisters, so did I. So did I. We don't walk away with these guilt things saying, you're just damaged goods, you're no good for anything. We walk away from being in the presence of God, growing, flourishing. Something of beauty is blossoming in our hearts and lives. Something of fruitfulness is taking place. Amen. That's his promise. Why? Because God didn't only design his church to be like a home. He didn't only design his church to be like a school. But God did design his church also to be like that tabernacle. Like that place where we can approach the Lord together as brothers and sisters to worship him and love him. I know you do it at home. You should do it at home. But there is something special about God's presence when we gather together. And he blesses it. He blesses it. Well, not only that, man, we are, here we are, we're, we're like the, the palm tree and the cedar of Lebanon, and we're flourishing now. But look at the first part of verse 14. Those of you who are older than me, once we read that, I want you to say aloud, amen. And it, so it says in the first part of verse 14, read it with me. They will still bear fruit in old age. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> For the YouTubers, you didn't hear that. Um, some rowdy person in the back said, you're not that far behind. I just thought you should know that. You know, old age, let me tell you, old age has its challenges. I heard a great, I heard a great uh, story. I was with a pastor friend the other day, and he was telling me that there was this fellow, he had finally retired, and all he wanted to do in his retirement was to play golf. And um, so he was just in, you know, going out and playing golf, and he would come home just not, not happy, not fulfilled, kind of grumpy. 
And his wife said, well, what in the world is the matter? He said, my eyesight has gotten so bad, I'm spending half the day looking for the ball. I just think I'm going to give up golfing altogether. She said, oh, honey, you enjoy it so much. You don't, don't, I know you're getting older, and I know your eyesight is failing, but don't, this is an outing for you. Don't give it up. He said, well, what can I do? She says, well, Dad... He loves to go out. He's 90 years old, he said. Well, but dad has perfect eyesight. He could help you. And he thought about that and he said, he does have perfect eyesight. He can help me. So he called his dad, his father-in-law, and yeah, I'd come out with you, son. And so they're there in the cart, and they drove up to the first, uh, to the first green there, I mean to the first driving thing there, and a hole, and uh, here he, you know, the son just hits that. He says, now keep an eye on it, and dad says, I am. Boom, he hits it, and I mean just immediately the son couldn't tell where it was at. He said, you have your eye on it? He said, yep, good, good, good. And he hurries up and he gets in the cart, starts going down the path. He goes, where is it at? And the dad says, I don't remember. <laughs> there is challenges to getting old, I'm saying. But did you know there's something about being involved with God in his church gatherings and, and in his ministries that causes our fruitfulness to continue even in old age? It's true. That is because that there is no age limit in the house of God. Amen. Amen. And there's no forced retirement Amen. in the house of God. I want to tell you, and I, I, I'm saying this because I'm reading a lot of leadership books out there, Christian leadership books out there, that, that's pretty much saying that, that you've got to just, re, don't, you know, just only young people, the old people have no place, you know, we're, we're calling us different stuff and all this kind of thing. Listen, listen, I want to tell you something. The spirit-filled, spirit-led believer, regardless of how old they are, will always remain relevant. Amen. This is the truth. Just go in your Bible. How do you answer that when I'm reading this out of these books? Just say, let's look in our Bible, and I want you to go in the Bible, and I want you to see mighty moves of God, mighty men and mighty women of God that did mighty things of God, and then find out how old they were when they did it. Amen. You know, most of them were older than me. That's ancient. All right. So what is it? What is it about being planted in church that helps even, even when we are old to continue to bear fruit? It's because God has also designed his church to be like a spiritual gym. It's where we exercise our gifts in our ministry. It's where we team up with fellow members and, and we accomplish kingdom things that otherwise would be impossible for any one person to do. It's amazing. Church is like a home. Church is like a school. Church is like his tabernacle. Church is like a spiritual gym. And then he gives one more promise. The last part of verse 14. Read it with me, would you? They will stay fresh and green. Now, the way this is written, the they there is not the old. The way this is written is the they is the people he's talking about at the very beginning in, verse nine, in, in, in verses 12. The righteous will flourish because they're planted in the house of the Lord. And then it says they, 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 they. And that's what he's saying here. Now, in the NIV, it says fresh and green. If you have an English Standard Version or a King James Version, it says ever full of sap and very green. But I was looking in the Hebrew this week. It was really great. I, in fact, it made me laugh. The Hebrew, literal Hebrew for this, it says, they will be fat and green green. And I thought, that's the way I was about a year ago when I was in the hospital, man. I, you know, ooh. Well, fresh, full of sap, fat, you choose. 
The point is this. Because we are planted in church, God blesses us with the stuff that not only keeps us growing, not only keeps us going, but get this, keeps us fresh. See, there's an old saying around our church. We say it a lot, and I'll continue it. I'll just keep saying it. If you think green, you'll grow. If you think ripe, you'll rot. And there's something about just, just being involved and being planted in church life and just being around one another that, that you know what? We realize, would you say amen to this? Everyone, if you know this is true, there's always more about God that we can discover. Amen. There's always new experiences from the Holy Spirit we can experience. Amen. Amen. There's always something else in our life that can display Jesus. Amen. Amen. There is just always, and, there's, and, and we stay fresh because we're in that place where that is what's going on. It's because not only church is like a house, not only church is like a school, not only church is like a tent of his meeting, not only church is like a spiritual gym, but God designed his church to be like a spiritual hospital. Sometimes, folks, we are less than fresh. Sometimes we're just weary and, and just not doing great. Sometimes we're burdened. Sometimes we're just... But you know what? When we come in and we allow the people of God to minister to us, and they do, and we just receive when, like I'm going to do today, have you guys pray in little groups and say, Lord, they're going to pray something for me, and I believe you're going to use them. I believe that you're going to flow through that person and touch me. There's something of a reviving effect, a freshening effect, of, of just wonderful stuff that happens. Now, I realize I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I realize that you guys, you're planning yourself here. God has called us together. We are being built together, one another. I realize that. But you know what? Every one of us has friends and acquaintances that though they love the Lord, they're not being a regular part of church anymore. They aren't. Do you remember there in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where the Word of God tells us, do not forsake the assembly together as some are in the habit of doing? Now, don't you find that really interesting that it says people are in the habit of not coming to church? We think in modern days, Total opposite. We think coming to church has to become a developed habit. But did you know, in, 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 in when you know about the joy of the Lord and the life of Christ, you remember when you first got saved? You couldn't get enough of the Word of God. You couldn't get enough of the fellowship. You couldn't get you away. But one thing would happen, or another thing would happen, and this or that, and and we started, we started. Break, we started making a different habit. Our spirit naturally draws us to the house of God. But we have to make it a habit to not be there. Amen. We do. Now this concerns me and I'll tell you why. You see, Jesus told us in Matthew 24 that before he comes, he said, many will fall away from the faith. And he also said, the love of most. I don't want us to be among the many or the most. The love of most will grow cold. And when we look at that, when we think many will fall away from the faith, we think, oh, they're not going to love Jesus anymore. It's not what the Lord is talking about. 
Because when you understand New Testament faith, it's just not our love and belief in Jesus. See, people, people aren't showing up. They're not opening their Bibles. They're not praying. They're, they're, they're not being a part of a regular church. They said, oh, I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus. They think they're okay. Our faith in Jesus is expressed in our obedience to Jesus and his word. Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus said in, in a, in a different, um, different time, in Luke 18, he said, when the Son of Man comes back to earth, will he find faith? And he's talking about persistence in prayer. It's amazing how many Christians are not praying. And how many Christians are not coming together to pray. You, you, you want to have a church service empty? I'll tell you, tell you what you do. Call for prayer meeting. I don't care. God tells us to do it. We're doing it. Here's the point. You have friends and acquaintances that, you know what? They do love the Lord. But they're loving him on their terms. They're loving him as a savior. But they're not embracing him as Lord anymore of their life. And the Bible calls that a crisis of faith. And it's true. And we need to share with them. We need, we need to be able to say, hey, you know what? You, your spiritual life, your, your relationship with God was designed to be planted in church. And then share these promises. You'll thrive, you'll make it, you'll, you'll, you'll flourish, you'll become quality, you'll keep bearing fruit even in your old age, you'll stay fresh in the goodness and the things of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And just pray with them. And see what happens. See, the Bible says that, again, when we stand before the Lord, it ain't going to be like Desi Arnaz and, and Lucy, and the Lord's not going to be saying, you have some splaining to do. It's not going to be like that. The Bible tells us we're going to stand before the Lord, and it's just simply going to be an open Bible. And the Word of God is going to be presented again. And our life will either bear witness to it through our obedience or not. Now, by the way, at that point in time, if you're before the Lord, you made it. As soon as you, if you die and you're believing in Jesus, trusting in Him as your Savior, you made it. Hallelujah. But this really is about bringing Him glory. This really is about the rewards that He so wants to bestow on us. Amen? All right. Isn't that great? You could stay fresh and green. Isn't it wonderful you could bear fruit even in old age? That you'll flourish even before the presence of God? That you're going to, have, you're going to be quality like the cedars of Lebanon? That you'll flourish like a palm tree no matter how harsh it is out there? God is designed for you to enjoy these blessings. Let's just keep getting planted in with one another. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for our church and our church family and what you've done. I, I love this church, and if I wasn't the pastor, I'd be here at this church. I just love being with everybody. And, a part of everybody. And Lord, we're not the only church in town. There are wonderful, viable churches in our community, and I thank you for them as well. It's by your design, Father God, in your glory. Father, help us to just get our roots in there, to just start becoming responsible as, as believers and to enjoy the, the, the promises that you have for us. But Father, every one of us has someone on our heart right now 
that though they, they love and claim Jesus, Father, they're not, they're not living his work. They're not doing what Jesus asked us to do. And we're concerned for them, Lord. Please bring them to you. Please, in your grace and mercy, draw them back to a place. Please let them, let them become aware that there's a crisis in their faith going on right now. And help them become aware. And how we bless you and how we thank you for that. And we love you. And, and brothers, let's just bless our church, shall we? Let's just ask God's blessing on every facet of it. Go ahead, would you? Lord, we pray blessings on every facet of who we are and what you've called us to be. I bless our church in the name of Jesus. I worship you and thank you, God. Now, would you take a moment and stand, please? And can you pray with one another? Two, three four people would you just pray with one another the Lord is going to use that person praying for you and God is going to refresh something in your heart and life right now God is going to revive something in your heart God's going to heal something in your body right now in Jesus name go ahead pray for one another Lord we bless you and thank you and we pray for one another now God in the name of Jesus Lord God, we bless them with your touch and your healing power, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your touch.